I'm just going to have our um, our panelists, uh, our esteemed speakers, uh, just quickly introduce yourselves uh, before we launch into the first question. So I will just go around the Zoom. Uh, awesome, let's start with you. Just uh, introduce yourself, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tish and my colleagues, Margaret, Dave, and Sadia for convening and organizing this event. My name is Azam Nizamuddin. Uh, I'm from Bloomingdale, and I have a background in religious studies at the graduate level, and I taught at both Elmhurst College and Loyola University um, for many, many years, world religions, and in particular, Islamic theology and history. Uh, but professionally, I'm also an attorney, so I just, uh, yeah, I love the fast uh, the subject of religion and philosophy and ideas and ethics. So uh, when I heard this uh, event was going on, I, of course, signed up. So uh, I look forward to the discussion on spirituality and religion, which you know are very interesting and important concepts. So I look forward to hearing my fellow pa panelists. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Reverend Dave Daubert. Thanks. Um, well, I'm Dave Daubert, and as uh, Tish shared, I'm at Holy Trinity and Zion as pastor. I've been at Zion now. This is my 20th year here. Um, before that, I was a um, before I was a pastor, I was an engineer. Um, so my initial training was in engineering. Uh, married to Marlene, who is a deacon, also been a seminary um, graduate and was ordained in our tradition as well. So I work with my wife. And um, in terms of the topic, um, I've always found myself to be a spiritual person in seeking, but I was never really um, introduced to organized religion in a big way until I was in college. I didn't grow up in the church or in any kind of organized religious practice, but I had certain connections and role models that kind of fed my spiritual curiosity. So the topic of how spirituality and religion intersect is a part of my own story. And um, as I've come to understand that, um, hopefully I'll have a few things to contribute along the way with regard to that that are um, grounded in my story, but also helpful to other people as well. That's wonderful. And we have Rabbi Margaret Frisch Klein. Um, thank you, Tish and Sadia, and, and frankly, the Coalition of Elgin Religious Leaders as well for wanting to do this kind of in-depth dialogue. I think it's really important for a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, like Dave, this is a second career for me. Um, and I grew up in a home that was very Jewish, but not very religious. And we'll, we can talk about that more later. Um, for my parents, it was all about the ethics of Judaism and the peoplehood of Judaism. And, and so um, I wouldn't have necessarily considered myself to be a spiritual person, but that's a piece of my story too. So it'll be interesting to see how this panel develops. <laughs> well, let's get to it then. My first question for you all is, in your faith, what do religion and spirituality mean? Are they separate concepts or are they two parts of a, a whole? Uh, Dave, let's start with you. Well, I think in my faith, um, I've come to see them as more integrated over time. Um, I, I think of spirituality as um, how I attend to my spirit and how I attend to matters that we might call spiritual. Uh, what that means um, to each person is probably different. So I think that's a very diverse reality. I wouldn't want to impose what spirit and spirituality mean in terms of our topic. But for me, it's grounded in my own um, awareness of, of a God who's involved in the world. And of course, as a Christian, how that God in our faith has somehow participated in the world with Jesus. So for me, spirituality and connection to God are grounded in Jesus, and so is religion. So they, they begin to overlap pretty intentionally. I would also say that I think it's, um, in my mind, not possible to be spiritual with an intentionality without becoming religious. Now, that doesn't mean organized religion, but I think anytime you have intentionality around something, if you're having a spiritual life, let's say, and say, I'm a spiritual person, and you're uh, intentional about that, you develop patterns and behaviors that are your own structure. So I think all people are innately religious because religion is actually the constructs and how we organize and create things for ourselves. 
and spirituality is that to which we're attending. So I do think that it's actually not possible to be spiritual and not religious. If you're intentional about attending to your spirituality, you'll develop religious practices in your own life. You'll, we all have patterns that we use over time, even if they're ones that I've developed for myself. So, so rituals in terms of patterns, is that what you mean? Yeah, but even habits, I don't know that we're always conscious, but we, you know, we ritualize people tend to get up about the same time in the morning and we, we build, we build patterns into our lives. And so if you're building patterns or practices or things you attend to, even if you say, Oh, I, I tend to at the late in the day when the sun's going down, I tend my spirituality is watching the sunset. Okay. Well, that's become a new ritual for you or a habit, something I attend to. So I think all of us innately build behaviors into our life to attend to the things we think are important. And then organized religion, if you will, is then hopefully spiritual in the sense that it's attending to something in a communal setting. It's something that we've agreed on, whether I'm um, a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, we have patterns that we've owned in our traditions that we share with other people who are journeying in a similar way. So I would think about spirituality as attending to that which is in your mind spiritual, which is its own diverse thing. Religion is how do I create behaviors and patterns in my life to do that and then organize religion is how do I participate in something beyond myself that's communal and for now maybe that's where I'll stop but to, in my mind they're integrated because my personal spirituality my organized religion spirituality are somewhat connected to each other and therefore for me I think of myself as spiritual and communally religious and that I belong to something bigger than myself very interesting. I like that communally religious. Uh, let's go to uh, Rabbi Margaret. So what does religion and spirituality mean in, in Judaism? For those of you who have heard me whine for the last month or so on this very topic, I finally came up with some of the answers late yesterday afternoon. Um, I will remind people that I'm here representing a 5,000 year old tradition and both the word spirituality and religion come from the Latin, which uh, might trip some people up a little bit. So um, similar to Dave in some respects, I think that spirituality has to do with trying to find um, a connection to something beyond ourselves. And that the word religion itself comes from the Latin religio, meaning to tie back up into. So the goal of religion, as I learned from Ralph Waldo Emerson, is to, that great joke, no, just a joke. Um, it was to, to find a way to find those connections. It's about connection. Um, and as I often tell people, if you, um, are with a bunch of Jewish people. There are two Jews and one dog and three opinions. So I apologize for the dog, Simon, you may have to come deal with them. Um, and so um, it, I think it's tricky. And, and, and so anything that I say today is my own opinion only um, for right now. And by the time I listen to the other two panelists, it may change even as we go through this discussion. But Judaism is seen as a religion and it has a deep spirituality embedded in it. Uh, and I think that the word spirituality comes from spirit or breath. And in Judaism, the Hebrew word for that is nefesh or ruach. Those don't even necessarily go together. And our souls themselves our breath itself. So in fact, in one of our morning prayers, we're told that the soul that God has given us is pure and that you have breathed it into us. And that seems to be a very spiritual concept. So I think I will stop there for now. Okay, thank you. Awesome. I'll mute again until the dog disappears. <laughs> uh, the dog might actually have some uh, thoughts about spirituality. Um, we can discuss animals and, and religion perhaps in, a, in another, uh, another uh, program in this series. Okay, Azam. Yeah, so um, I think that 
the two terms, um, religion and spirituality, uh, they're very difficult to divide, uh, define. Uh, they have very broad range of areas that we can consider. Uh, from my perspective, I think religion is a much more broader term. Uh, it's broader because it encompasses um, an organized set of, say, faith, faiths, belief systems, creeds, uh, as well as structures for, say, you know, like a collective set of rules and perhaps activities, you know, involving, you know, space and time and things like that. Whereas spirituality um, is more, I would say, it's kind of a, what uh, Margaret alluded to, which is something sort of beyond ourselves. It's an experience or an expression of something that is uh, sort of hidden, uh, latent within or sometimes beyond beyond our earthly sort of manifestation or experience sometimes the word transcendental is used um, specifically as it pertains to islam uh, the word religion is often uh, comes from the word din d-i-n or d-e-n how it depends how you transliterate it uh, so my name nizam din means organizer of religion the last name. Um, and it has a much more broader sense. And there's a tradition that actually kind of defines these different terms. So in Islam, religion consists of the following, consists of uh, Islam, the term Islam, the term Iman, and then the term Ihsan. Islam here refers to a set of organized practices. So your daily worship, your pilgrimage, your fasting in Ramadan, and your charity. Often these are known as the five pillars. Iman refers to your set of beliefs. So your belief in one God, your belief in angels and spirits, uh, uh, your beliefs in prophets that were sent from God, your uh, beliefs in the different scriptures that were sent, the, the Torah, the gospel, and the Quran, for example. And then finally, uh, Ehsan, which is a sort of, again, a difficult term to translate, but often defined as um, perfection of your faith. And it's a relationship between you and God. And I think that term is really the closest we have to spirituality because it refers to something beyond ourselves, beyond the practices that we have and the practices of what we believe as a creed, for example. So Islam kind of in a, in a nice, neat format <laughs> actually defines these terms you know, for us. So we kind of understand these different dimensions of religion, right? Because religion has different concepts of space and time, deity, creed, et cetera. Uh, whereas spirituality to me is a subset of the broader term of religion. Hmm. So it I'll stop there and then we'll go more <laughs> into specifics. So it appears that uh, we all seem to agree that um, spirituality is, is something bigger than us. And religion seems to be more of the, um, the codified or you know, organized um, principles and beliefs and uh, and they cer certainly can go um, hand in hand. Um, how would you all describe yourselves? Uh, would you describe yourselves primarily as more spiritual or religious or uh, another term completely? Um, and having, said, having asked that, um, is there anybody in your life, uh, past or present, um, that you would say, you know, this is a really spiritual person or a really religious person maybe somebody that you would model yourself after or somebody who was a mentor uh, or somebody who was, um, you know, a, a, a beloved clergy figure for you. Um, and uh, so kind of veering off a little bit, um, what, what are the roles of, of others in, in developing one's spirituality or, or religious practice? Um, let's start with uh, Margaret, Rabbi Margaret with this one. So how would you describe yourself and uh, who are some of the people that, that you've met along the way? So um, I guess I would describe myself as both. One may in fact be an occupational hazard since I do represent an organized religion or an institutional religion. Um, the other has been slower to develop given the fact that um, at least my father described himself as a Jewish atheist uh, and I think that at least in Judaism in this country, there has been a pendulum that has swung between 
um, maybe the reform movement of Judaism of the late 19th century through, I don't know, the 60s and 70s um, of being very rational. If you couldn't prove God's existence, it was about other pieces. Um, and the pendulum has swung back to searching for meaning. I think sometimes the, the spirituality piece is one of searching for meaning. And, and I, I can't remember which, which of my esteemed colleagues talked about this, but what's meaningful to me may not be meaningful to Dave or to Tish or to Azam, right? Um, and so it's each person's obligation, if you will, to search for that meaning. The word Israel actually means God wrestler. And so there's a lot of wrestling that goes on. Um, in terms of who have been those spiritual guideposts, I would say the rabbi in Grand Rapids, Rabbi Al Lewis, um, and the clergy in the town that I was working in, Chelmsford, Massachusetts, always played uh, volleyball on Friday mornings at a Baptist camp. I was the token woman for a while. That's a whole different piece of spirituality. And I think there might be a difference in spirituality between men and women, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so one of those volleyball players is, is actually the person I would still describe, although less so these days, as my spiritual director. Uh, and he would be an Episcopal priest. He was the one who finally got tired of me talking about I wanted to be a rabbi, I wanted to be a rabbi, and he um, actually, well, the Academy for Jewish Religion wouldn't use the actual quote. What we used in the program was fish or cut bait. You guys can figure out what the real quote was. <laughs> um, so those would be two of them, and then my rabbi in, in Boston, Rabbi Neil Kaminsky. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, always good to have mentors in, in one's life, I, I believe. Uh, next, let's go to Dave. Your thoughts? Well, I think in my life, my spirituality and religion, as I said, developed separately um, in terms of family structure. But I, I was fortunate. I lived next door to one of my best friends, uh, lifelong friends. His name was Tom, was very active in church. And then I had a science teacher in junior high school who was also an itinerant United Methodist minister. Um, so he, he taught science Monday through Friday and preached on Sundays. So some of the debates that have mired um, some wings of Christianity around six days that are literally 24 hours um, in creation and those kinds of things, um, the integration of things, let's say science and faith, which is sometimes put as its own polarity, um, were kind of naturally woven into my conversations. And I was raised by people, my parents were both math majors in college. So I was raised by very rational, not particularly religious people. And I would say in various ways, my parents have differing degrees of spirituality. So, so for me, those two people, my friend Tom and my, my science teacher, Mr. Persina, who eventually left teaching and went to seminary and became an ordained pastor in a fuller sense later in his life, uh, were important people. After I got into church, um, I had several people over the years that have impacted me. Some of them, a guy named Wayne Stumme, who was my um, master's thesis advisor, was very spiritual and very committed to justice and very committed to engaging a community. He didn't see spirituality um, as separate from engaging the world. Mm. Um, so he had a very integrated sense of God and people in the terms of uh, connection, if you want to use that kind of vertical, the kind of simple system of a vertical axis, but that also very horizontal sense. Um, in the Lutheran tradition, which I'm part of, there's a book by a guy named Jake, um, George Farrell. The title is called Faith Active in Love. And so spirituality and how we interact with each other are, are deeply integrated into Lutheran ethics and to much Christian ethics. And Wayne was really committed to that. So he was a, a supporter of, of workers' rights and all kinds of things. And, but at the same time, he got up every morning, read his New Testament in Greek, you know, the original language and translated, was very disciplined, uh, had a, a deep, uh, profound prayer life. He attended to his personal spirituality. 
to his corporate spirituality as a leader in the church and as a pastor, and to his commitment to the world. And so I think if you think about God, self, and neighbor, those three axes, um, which are in Jesus' uh, great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, uh, both halves of which come from the Old Testament tradition. Margaret can tell you more about, about that, that this integration of spiritual, which we tend to think of in our minds incorrectly, I think, as, as, um, as kind of ethereal, and secular or daily life, which is physical, the integration of those two things, because it's a false dichotomy in itself. Everything is spiritual at some level. Wayne was really good at saying, if you're going to be a spiritual person, you've got to pay attention to God and you have to pay attention to the people God puts in your life. I'll That's stop and I'll let you So it simple, it's beautiful. <laughs> okay, Asim, your thoughts. Um, so uh, personally, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm a religious person. I come from a religious family and I am doing my darndest to be more and more spiritual. Um, and I think the way to explain that would be that my parents, uh, so my parents are immigrants and came from India. And by the way, you should know that there are over 200 million Muslims in India. So about 15% is the second largest tradition. So there's a lot of Muslims there. Um, and a lot of immigrants from there came to the United States in the 60s and 70s. So uh, my parents would be the first people. My mom in particular was a very pious woman who really um, you know, often reminded us to do our prayers and, and, and beseech God for things that we desired or wanted. And then when I went to college, oddly enough, I went to Loyola University, which at that time, the 80s, we had to take three theology courses and three philosophy courses. And that really, for the first time in my life, introduced me to the academic study of religion. And mm -hmm. I went in as a pre-med major, like all South Asian kids did at that time. <laughs> um, and then I wound up being a theology major. And it was because I just found it so interesting. I found Christian theology, but also the historical development of Christianity fascinating. And then for my senior thesis, I sort of compared uh, this very important theologian named Al-Ghazali, probably the most significant Islamic theologian and also very influential in Western uh, religions. I, I did a study of him and Thomas Aquinas. So that really sort of took me to a trajectory of <clears throat> taking religion very seriously from a academic, historical, intellectual perspective. And that would include philosophical perspective. And when I did my graduate study, I had mentors. Uh, these were Americans, oddly enough, Americans who grew up in the 50s and 60s, 60s, who then went overseas and studied, you know, and did their PhDs doing field research in North Africa and the Muslim world, who converted to Islam and came back and are professors in universities, for example. And I never met human beings like that before. <laughs> human beings who were American, and they knew more about Islam than anyone I'd ever met before. Mm. So the idea of somebody who was well-versed in Islamic sources, who read Arabic, who read ancient manuscripts in Arabic, in Persian, um, in Turkish, and at the same time were American and understood the Western world was just, it was like, to me, it was like un unbelievable. I never met people with that kind of background. So I think those were my sort of influencers. And ultimately, Al-Ghazali, the famous theologian from the 12th century, um, who wrote this, you know, 100 different books and things like that, have continued to be my mentors in terms of trying to engage in a more spiritual dimension. And let me just explain that really briefly. So everyone knows, for example, that in Ramadan, Muslims fast, right? We fast from dawn to sunset, which means we abstain from food and water and sexual relations. Kind of everyone generally knows that if they're sort of at least well read and things like that. Now, Ghazali's approach to fasting in Ramadan is the following. He says the basic form of fasting is exactly what I just explained, which means you abstain from food and water and you're done. And that's how most people fast. For Ghazali, the second level of fasting means that your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your limbs also abstain from any sin or any conduct that would hurt any person or yourself. 
And then finally, he's not done there. The most elite of the elite form of fasting would be to spend your entire month of Ramadan, not just abstaining from food and water, not just abstaining from not harming others or yourself, verbally, intellectually, and so forth, but also focusing on nothing other than God, developing a very direct relationship that is sort of dependent on God on a constant level. So those three levels sort of, to me, sort of exemplify that idea of religion and spirituality in Islam. So to fast from the physical world, uh, which might prove to be rather tricky for a good many of us. Uh, before I get into the next question, uh, we have a question from an audience member. Uh, and I think it uh, would lead into uh, the next question I wanna ask, as well as tie into this last one. Um, Beryl writes, spirituality is frequently equated with mindfulness. Is it fair to say that spirituality is about how we fit into the larger world rather than tied to a belief in God? Uh, whoever would like to jump in on that one. I have a few thoughts. I would say yes and no. <laughs> Um, the sense, <laughs> Jewish that, I think it's fair to say that spirituality includes how we fit into the larger world, no question. But I wouldn't say necessarily rather than God. I would say, as I mentioned with Wayne Stummy, that, that in a sense, um, it's possible to have a spirituality and not have a belief in God. I want to emphasize that, that you can be, um, you know, a Jewish atheist. You can be a Christian atheist, um, which seems harder um, in some ways, because Christianity has less of the of the people of God chosen, the, the ethnic identity that Judaism brings. But we know that there are a number of people who attend Lutheran churches, for example, in the church that I'm part of, and this would be true across the board, who don't really have any real conceptual belief in a God, that they're at least agnostic. They don't have the, they don't necessarily define themselves and their beliefs and structures by the system that they participate in. They participate for some other reason. They grew up in it. Their grandfather built this church. Their spouse um, thinks it's important, and so they attend. Um, their kids are in seventh grade, and the grandparents want them to go through confirmation, so we bring our kids to church. So we know a certain percentage of people who participate in organized religion, and probably across all traditions, and I'm sure this is probably true for Islam and Judaism in different proportions, in different have a spirituality that doesn't require God um, or have a defined belief. But at the same time, I don't think that I would um, juxtapose them to say that one is about how we fit into the larger world and the other is about or not about belief in God because I think for an integrated spirituality if God is part of your your structure your mindset a healthy spirituality would include both it's certainly mindfulness but but true mindfulness um, in the full sense may include extra engagement in the world not just separation from it um, and that being mindful, being attentive, being clear is not always just an introspective thing. It's more about a focus, mm. uh, attentiveness. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it's how we fit into the literature, that a mindful spirituality that is has a, a, a belief in divinity of, of some theological source would probably in many cases be mindful in a way that is tied to how your belief in God shapes the way you engage the world. Wow. And so I would say it could be both and, that it's possible that you could be spiritual and mindful apart from a belief in God if you don't have a belief in God. But I think it's probably impossible to have a belief in God and have a spiritual life and not have your worldview about who that God is not impact how you think about engaging the world, period. Because I think any integrated worldview will automatically be intersecting in, in a number of places. So I would say yes and no, but I don't think it's possible to have a spirituality of the world and have a belief in God where the two don't somehow affect each other because I think they're in a healthy sense integrated. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. I was almost with you to the end. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, I was yeah. almost with you to the end. Uh huh. Um, Remember, I was talking about that pendulum, and one of the things that happened historically is that in the uh, 60s and 70s, people, Jews, 
some Jews in this country got frustrated with the big structures that were springing up in what I would call suburban Judaism. And they really wanted to have that direct relationship with God or Judaism on their own terms and not just because the rabbi and the cantor from the high bima, the high stage said, this is what you should do. And so that's when um, the Havara movement of small groups meeting in living rooms developed, but also a focus on, on Eastern religion and some of the mindfulness. For the last 20 years, there's been a group called, and the, the, um, the head of it now lives in Evanston, was the Dean of Students at, at University of Chicago's um, School of Theology or Seminary or whatever that one is called, but it's the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. And I'm just, I, I printed this out so that I could read it to you. For over 20 years, the Institute of Jewish Spirituality has helped thousands of people every year to slow down, reconnect with themselves in the world and rediscover their sense of sacred purpose. We invite you to explore our website, blah, 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 blah. But I, I sort of liked that idea that that sense of mindfulness, which is part of spirituality, uh, may have come from really working hard on some of the Eastern religion practices around meditation um, is, is very much a piece of this. Earlier in the week, I, my, my seminary hosted a conference on spiritual resilience. The timing could not have been better if they had tried. Um, and the presenter who is a a PhD psych psychologist doing research on spiritual awakening. I think that's the name of the awakened brain. She's really doing the brain science on this, says that the research has shown that if you do a Venn diagram of spiritual and religion and you see where that intersection is, 70% of Americans, all Americans are in that, that overlapping piece. What I then thought was interesting is that 30% of millennials find their spirituality in art, music, or nature. While two thirds of those millennials, aren't you glad I took notes on this? Two thirds of those millennials believe in God, whatever that means, okay? The other thing that I thought was particularly interesting in terms of this um, is that that transcendent relational piece, according to the science of this, is one third innate and two thirds environmental. I don't know how they controlled for that in those studies, but, but there you have it. And that it's about that hungering for connection um, that really begins, and, and each of us talked about our college experience, right? Really begins in late adolescence. So the the focus of this conference was really, if we can catch teenagers, then, then there may be less anxiety and depression. That was really the force of, of the science behind this. And then for me, who went into the rabbinate because I was going to be the social action rabbi, um, tikkun olam, which definitely has a mystical piece to it, is the thing that most that tikkun olam is to repair the world and, and there's a mystical component and a story that goes with that, but um, that's apparently what most strengthens the spiritual brain. That's my new learning for the week. Wow, that's fascinating. I didn't even think to delve into, you know, a, a, a connection with the, the brain, but uh, certainly- Well, they were doing it this morning on On Being. Mm. So there seems to be this real connection in terms of whole body mm -hmm. meditation. Well, it makes sense. I mean, certainly meditation and yoga and other more physical, you know, spiritual disciplines, um, for lack of a better phrase, you know, there are those studies that show, you know, they really do calm your, your brain and your brain waves change and, you know, uh, yeah. excellent if, you know, you suffer from anxiety and depression and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something about, you know, an, an active prayer life, a, a spirituality that, that does affect you physically. Um, 
that could actually be the topic of a another another program, um, sort of the, the physical <laughs> connection. Um, I just wanted to read a, a comment. Um, Shirley says, I equate, I equate spirituality with energy. I think it was Einstein who said, everything is energy and energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. So for me, spirit equals soul equals consciousness. It, spirit, spirituality can exist with or without a belief in a deity. I think, and this is just my opinion, that spirituality connects one spirit or soul or consciousness to another and to all other spirit souls consciousnesses. I believe it is through spirituality that we can feel connected to or united with the cosmic energy in all lives. Again, this is only my opinion. Um, I wanna catch what uh, Awesome has to say about um, uh, when people say I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, what are they saying? Let's uh, segue into the next question. And alongside that, um, we hear the phrase organized religion and it's certainly popped up uh, today. Um, it has sort of a, a negative tinge to it. Um, you know, people who don't go to church will say, I don't do organized religion. Um, when they say they're not religious, it's because it's organized religion that they're uh, somehow um, protesting against. So what does that actually mean? And then how does that tie into, well, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm spiritual. Um, for those of you who are, are clergy, the, the two of you, um, how, how do you address that if you do uh, in, your, in your congregations? Um, is, it a, is it a big issue? Um, you know, we also uh, hear that um, a huge percentage, and I'm not quite sure what the, the number is, of Americans now identify as nuns, as, not as in um, Catholic nuns, but N-O-N-E-S. Uh, people who have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Um, now, whether or not they profess to be spiritual, uh, I don't know what the numbers are there either. Um, Asim, let's start with you. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that the idea of spirituality not being tied down to religion or deity or a God, I think is a re relatively recent phenomenon. And recent, I mean, in the history of religions. So I would say certainly the 20th century. Although I'm sure there were signs of it, you know, uh, earlier on with the Enlightenment, European Enlightenment movement. Um, for me, I, I think, I, for me, I love organized religion. Uh, I love my organized religion, but I also love, you know, Catholicism and organized Judaism because I believe that tradition is really sacred, it's very important, because tradition helps you understand the historical development. Um, you know, the people who wrote, like I said, you know, who wrote in the 11th, 12th century, whether it was, you know, Aquinas, or whether it was Maimonides, or whether it was El Ghazali, these were not, you know, people who just kind of were sitting around and twiddling their thumbs. These are extremely, extremely deep, sophisticated, and serious thinkers who had a wealth of experiences around the world. Maimonides was in Spain. He lived under Muslim Spain, and then he lived under uh, Muslim um, Egypt. Uh, and it was all these different experiences that he encountered uh, that you know he wrote about uh, his own religious expressions and understanding. Ghazali was the same way. You know, he was Persian, but he wrote in Arabic. Um, you know, people who wrote and understood multiple cultures and languages, and they had diversity around them. And they wrote tons of books about this issue. So that to me is part of tradition. And I don't simply you know, dismiss it because I don't know it exists or that I don't understand it. I think that's very important. So I think that the idea that <clears throat> uh, spirituality without, you know, uh, without religion or say deities is, is a new phenomenon. Now, in terms of whether we can sort of um, uh, understand when people say I'm not religious but I'm spiritual frankly I don't know I you would have to ask them what they really mean I have some ideas you know about what I think it refers to but I would be sort of presumptuous and perhaps even you know overly judgmental in understanding what they mean by that for example when I studied uh, religion and philosophy at the graduate level one of the concepts we studied was metaphysics Okay. Mm -hmm. And metaphysics really comes from, uh, you know, both the interplay between 
Greek thought such as uh, Aristotle, because Aristotle wrote a book called Metaphysics, which ultimately became extremely influential in classical Islam, classical Judaism, and classical Christianity or Catholicism. Um, but I remember about 15 years ago, I went to, I think it was Barnes and Nobles or Borders. Remember Borders? It used to be around. Um, <laughs> and I went to their section, they had a section on metaphysics. And there was nothing about Christianity, nothing about Islam, nothing about Judaism. It was all what we call sort of contemporary, you know, new wave or new science religion. And I was baffled. I'm like, wait, metaphysics? Because when, <laughs> when I think of metaphysics, I think of Al-Ghazali. I think of Aristotle, Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, as he's known in the West. So they had wiped Maimonides. away or ignored the history. Yeah. So my point is, how is this metaphysics? I go, this is mislabeled, but I talked to someone, like, no, no, this is new science. The new. So I, I think that this new movement is interesting. This new movement, which seeks to get away from traditional religion, which seeks to get away from the church, at the same time wants to employ the terminology of religion. And I think that's extremely interesting. And I, I haven't done enough research to understand that, but I find it very interesting that they use this, things like soul, sacred, spirituality, but it's completely devoid of history, tradition, deity, uh, certain aspects of culture and what we call traditional religion. And that's fine, but I just find it very interesting and fascinating because I don't know where that's headed or what they really mean by, it, you know? So I think you have to let them speak for themselves and say, what do you really mean? And how do you understand the role of religion historically? What do you, how do you understand culture, religion, uh, rituals, sacred space, pilgrimage? How does that fit into your life? You know, and things like that. Uh, so I think it's, um, it's a fascinating topic for discussion. I would jump in there on the same thing. My wife and I got back from Spain last night about 10 o'clock um, in the evening. Um, so Thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have a nap after this. <laughs> so I still got to go cut some grass, but my son-in-law cut most of my lawn, which was a great gift when we got home. I was very pleased and grateful for that gift. But um we were on pilgrimage. We actually, this is the 500th anniversary of Ignatius of Loyola traveling from Loyola to Montserrat. Um, and his kind of uh, conversion, he converted my story. It's a longer story than we have time for. But a pilgrimage, of course, which Azam just mentioned, is a trip for some religious or spiritual reason, or really in an integrated sense, both. Um, and so we traveled, some on foot, some in bus, uh, along this route over um, 10 days. Um, and some of the spiritual religious things involved going into monasteries and basilicas. Some of it um, um, involved walking in silent walk for six or eight miles along um, dirt roads and through fields and on, on country roads. So it was a very wide mix of individual practice walking quiet in silence for for miles or looking in church uh, celebrating communion in a worship service so it was a mix of things that people would recognize as religious and things that people would stereotype as spiritual but but i think again i think it's somewhat of a, a false dichotomy um, for those who are spiritual and religious they're, they're going to be more and more integrated which i think is what Azam's talking about as well and i totally agree with um, what Asim said about depth. I'm finding that one of the reasons that young people in our country, at least, and I can't speak to the, to the global phenomenons, but certainly within the Western world, I think this applies certainly in Europe and Canada in similar ways, um, is the lack of groundedness, not the essence of groundedness, that in a sense, many times we've not done enough of our spiritual teaching and clarification to connect the religious practice to the spiritual depth that it involves. And so the segue is not there. And, and honestly, the American education system um, doesn't teach people to make segues well, that people don't connect two things that seem like there's an obvious, if we're going here and here, it looks like they should meet. People don't close that gap well. And religious leaders and teachers have to do a better job of making the gaps close so that people can see why the practice evolved and emerged and was developed and what it intention was and how it relates to the need for connection, meaning, purpose, 
um, peace, calm, identity, all those things that people might identify as spiritual, which is in their mind on the other side of the gap, the religious world, the spiritual. So for example, St. Augustine, if I said to somebody, um, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us, that's a nice line. But if I tell you St. Augustine said that 1600 years ago, and it's still worth listening to, you'd listen differently. And, and in general, baby boomers, at least in the Christian tradition, valued um, freshness and insight, like, oh, that guy's smarter. That, you know. And people began to mistrust because personal wisdom that's not grounded in history is, is kind of fleeting. And I'm finding as a, I talk to younger and work with younger adults, especially, they're more interested not in what I think, but in how what I think connects to something bigger, and I would say deeper and, and more rooted. And so if I say, you know, St. Augustine said in the, in, you know, in the fifth century, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us. And that the truth is still true, you know, centuries and centuries later. That's actually much more useful than what does Pastor Dave think? And uh, I think younger generations value this connection. I think the disconnection in, in our society at a number of levels, which have included the ways we structure families, the way we relate to lots of institutions, not just the church, but the Qantas Club and the Elks are all, you know, the Masons, which were a secret society, have had billboards in Minnesota now advertising for members. Now, you know, you just think about the change in a culture where a secret society would put up a billboard because participation rates, connections are going. And I think the disconnections, people are hungry for ways to build connections in their life. And if the church or the synagogue or the mosque are more and more intentional about doing that, people will see spiritual and religious connecting again. But religious leaders have to do the work. We can't assume what we might have assumed a few hundred years ago, that people will assume spirituality and participating in organized religion are going to do it. People are more skeptical and more disconnected. And I think um, we have to be less lazy as teachers mm. and more challenging and more connected and help people build those. I think the word segue is a really important word that connecting people across these things to help them reintegrate thought that's become separated. That's why what Azam said about tradition and rootedness, I think is so important. And I think it's one of the keys for all of our religions to more effectively reach people who have disconnected and the segues have gotten wider. Now let's segue to Rabbi Margaret. It looks like she has something to say. <laughs> I've been editing this in my head. I'm gonna disagree slightly. Awesome. <laughs> um, what I'm hearing from people, and, and Azam is much more polite than I am, so I, I'll just put it out there. You're right, you should ask people what they mean when they say that they're spiritual and not religious. What I'm hearing from people who tell me that, and it's primarily wedding couples, they want some spiritual ceremony, but they don't necessarily want the trappings of organized religion, but they want a chuppah and they want to smash glass. So I don't know what that means, right? It trappings looks like they not want traps. the rituals <laughs> and the trappings, but part of what they're saying to me, and they have said this directly, is they don't want to be told what to do. So this is where I'm going to disagree with Dave. I'm not sure they want the history. I think we're living in a unique time in America, as far as I can tell, as an American studies major who's read a lot of history. I was not an engineering major. Um, but we do talk a lot about rugged individualism in this country. And we see that across a number of, of venues at this point. And I think it impacts our religious institutions. I'll use religious institutions. And by the way, my spiritual director would prefer institutional religion as opposed to organized religion, because he would point out, because I had this conversation with him last night, that many of our institutions are not so very organized. <laughs> and we all know that that could be true. Um, I, I don't know what to do with the, I don't want to be told what to do. Judaism has a number of different answers to almost every question. And um, we could pull sources like St. Augustine as well and say, this is what we've always taught. And I do agree 
that we need to be, what was your phrase, more, less lazy in our teaching or, or more diligent in our teaching um, and inform some of that. I think one of the things that many of our institutions struggle with is what I would call pediatric Judaism. You can fill in your own blank. You know, if you only drop the kids off at Sunday school and that's all you experienced being dropped off at Sunday school, you may not get to the, the less concrete how to light Shabbat candles, right? You might not understand the meaning behind, just because they're sitting behind me. Um, should, you know, whatever the ritual is, you may not understand the why or how it connects because you know there is as I was an educator so you know there is that continuum of of educational material this is a very you know adult conversation you can't do this with third graders just just to really jump in quickly there I think one of the things that's important is that if you want to understand and experience either religion or spirituality, I think there has to be a degree of humility involved. The humility mm -hmm. necessary to study, the humility necessary. To I'm going to be Christian here and say an amen real quick. I totally think that's <laughs> right. It's a, it's I agree a, too. It's a polite interruption. Keep going, Ozum. You know, yeah, <laughs> because the thing is, when I, when I encounter these kinds of things, I'm like, when I looked at it, and I remember someone asked me, why, you, why did, did you, why did you study Christianity? Why, why, why did you major in theology at a Catholic university? I said, there, this religion's been around 1,500 years. Who am I to simply dismiss it out of hand? I mean, that's the yeah. way I kind of approached it. And that doesn't mean you don't question, you, dis you don't disagree. Of course you do. But I mean, as a lawyer, I do that all the time. But I just think that you have to have a degree of humility to be able to question you know, this incredible, rich intellectual tradition. And if you are serious about questioning, challenging, dismissing it, I just think you have to be a more substantive individual on this topic. I mean, you can say, who cares? Uh, you know, I don't want to hear about this. I, I don't, you know, I don't need this or that. And um, what was the phrase that the question asked uh, that Mar Margaret, the people asked you? Um, why do I need they to want, do they want a spiritual religion they want a spiritual wedding but not necessarily a religious right wedding. right and my, and they don't thought, want to be told why don't you do and they don't yes, want to be told it. what to do they don't want to tell, tell you yeah, that's it they don't want to be told what to do so my response to that with that too bad when are you going to grow up right now that <laughs> you know and I think you can say that better market than I could because you know I, I like you said I try to be polite but I mean at the end of the day we have to get out of our teenage years intellectually you know and ask the tough questions and study. You know, as a Jew, if you don't know Mo Moses Maimonides' thoughts and you want to dismiss Judaism, I got a problem with that. If you are, you know, come from a Catholic tradition or a Protestant tradition and you've never studied, you know, Calvin, Luther, or you know, other important thinkers, and I, I and I face this all the time with my own um, tradition of people who are just kind of dismissive religion. I'm like. Have you, do you even know who Al Ghazali is? Do you know who Ibn Arabi is? Do you know, have you studied the teaching? You know, this incredible rich tradition, right? In all languages, by the way, not just limited to Arabic, but in Persian, Turkish, Urdu, the language might, and, uh, you know, Indonesian, African, et cetera. So if you haven't taken that time, then just admit that you don't care and don't want to spend time understanding. And then, you know, I'll take it, at least you're being forthright about it. But before you go there, at least read a book. Take a course. I mean, there's online courses, right? You can take from Harvard, other other places, and you know, even institutions like Margaret suggested offer these kinds of opportunities to learn. So I'm just saying that I think we have to take these subjects a little bit more seriously, and we should we should expect like I expect my children, my my kids are now older, they're in teenage, and when they approach any subject and they're dismissive and they don't take it seriously, what do I say? I say no, no, you need to take this more seriously. You need to study a little, bit, or you need to put the work in. And then come back to me. Yeah, and I would indicative of something that's going on in America anyway. We seem to not want to, and I'm painting a very broad general picture here. Um, we seem to not want to engage in intellectual pursuits anyway. You know, we're scrolling through our phones, we're binge watching whatever on Netflix. Not that there's anything wrong with that. 
Um, but how many but serial killers? The idea that you know we're you devoting want. our our intellectual <clears throat> power to exploring something like religion. Um, you know, again, to segue, we we tend not to want to connect. You know, to harmonize. You know, all of these different aspects of our of our human experience. Uh, Margaret, and then Dave. I want to say something um, to the panel in general. I really appreciate the opportunity every time I have the opportunity to explain Judaism to non-Jews because it sharpens my under you know makes me do my homework mm -hmm. and sharpens my understanding. And so, so this is a really and and sometimes it's that cutting edge, right, which represents some growth and yes even clergy people the best way to learn something to is to teach lifelong it. learning right um so i just want to thank you all for making me do this i, I would say in response to what both margaret and Azam said here that for example a couple who comes to the synagogue or the mosque or the church for a wedding and says that we're spiritual but not religious uh, one of the things that I do, because it's a great teaching opportunity, is I said, well, we're, we're having a wedding, so it'll have to be religious, because we're constructing a ceremony. And then we can decide how rooted it's going to be, and what spirituality we include in it. But it's impossible to have a wedding, or a funeral, or any of the rituals that perhaps people come to, to our institutions in sporadic form because of life passages and things, and not be religious. And so the reason they came to us, whether they want to do it or not, because you can go to the Justice of Peace and get married to the courthouse. Mm. Nobody comes to a synagogue or a mosque or a church and to talk to somebody about wedding without some religious instinct, whether that's from tradition or their own personal spirituality or whatever. Or their and parents the told them they is, had to. Now that we've decided that in fact you are religious in spite of the fact you don't want to admit that to yourself, let's talk about the spirituality that we're going to incorporate into this ceremony because it's really mm. so it's a real great opportunity to reconnect people that you wouldn't be here if you're not a religious person because there are plenty of assets in our society now that religion may be framed by um generational stuff that your grandmother wants you to be married in the church it may be something like you've always pictured walking down the middle aisle with a big long white dress and a train i mean there may be but these are religious impulses and so our job as teachers then is to take those opportunities, which only come in some people's lives sporadically, and help people at that moment dig a little deeper and, and in a sense, be re-humbled in a hopefully a good, gracious way to say, oh, you have more religious instinct than you want to admit, even to yourself, or you wouldn't be talking to me, because you could go down to the courthouse this afternoon and get married without me and without all your family gathering around and all these things. But you have a lot of religious images in you and your family's mind that are bringing you here to this moment. The question is, how will we integrate the spirituality you're hungry for and the religious impulses that you already have to make you more whole and to make this a better experience for you that might actually not just get you married, but help you start the next chapter of your life different? I like the way you're reframing that, right? And I am painfully aware I, I apologize, Aslam. I don't know as much about Islam as I should, although I've had classes. Um, that religious leaders, rabbis, cantors, priests, ministers, people in power in other generations and even currently have abused their power. And for some people that has really turned them off from institutional religion. Right, you know, I, I I actually know many of the people because I can see the attendees um, in the chat, and um, some of them have been really hurt by other religious leaders, and it's really hard. I mean, you know, every day there's somebody who tells me a story about some rabbi who was mean to them whether it was at their bar mitzvah or it was at camp or it was 
when they wanted to get married to somebody who wasn't Jewish. There's a long chat that I can't read right this second about why people marry non-Jews. Um, that sense of hurt is real. And the other thing that we have to do while we're not being lazy with our teaching is a lot of healing. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with anybody else besides me? Well, that's I, a very me, good uh, point. Can I respond to that really quickly? Please, I, please, please. And I think, I, th I think to me, and I don't know to what degree people experience that sort of both hurt and dissatisfaction with their own communities. But I think every community has that. I know, for example, I, you know, growing up as, you know, so the Muslim community is much younger than either the Jewish, um, the American Muslim community is much younger than either the American Jewish or Christian community. So our institutions essentially, <laughs> for lack of a better term, in the 70s, 80s, were just extremely undeveloped. Hmm. And a lot of kids of my generation, I just left the faith and, you know, intermarried and whatever, or they just left faith or they converted, not so much conversion, but they did ultimately stop practicing. Etc. And I recognized, I don't know why early on, that the fact that you have terrible teachers, and these were lay people, right? Lay people run mosques, not the clergy, for example, in Islam. And I recognize that these people who are running mosques and institutions, they themselves are not highly educated. But then because of my exposure to extremely educated and highly intellectual Islamic thinkers, I always think we can do better. And we have done better in the past. We know better. And if we just improve our institutions, and if we improve the training of clergy, rabbis, or say imams, et cetera, you know, that's the ideal perspective to have. And I always thought, I, I didn't allow, I, sh I should say, I didn't allow ignorant leaders in my community to affect my relationship to God or my view of Islam as a whole. Because if I were to do that, I would become discouraged and cynical. And I did not want that to affect my spirituality because to me, that's kind of important. So I think that's important to have. And I don't know why I, I'm personalizing this, but that's the only way I can explain it. Because I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Margaret, that, you know, we have a bunch of bonehead leaders and, you know, a bunch of ignorant leaders. And I just know that we could do better. And there are examples of people who are better. So I resort to, like, you know, like I said, reading classical text, because that's where I get my information, not necessarily from someone who's around. But fortunately, I did have some very good contemporary thinkers and leaders that I rely on as well. Well, we're almost out of time. Uh, any final thoughts, comments before we wrap things up? I'd just like to say thank you uh, to the library uh, for organizing this, as well as to Azam and Margaret um, for participating. Um, I think interfaith dialogue and reflection on how spirituality, religion, um, meaning and purpose, there's so many questions in people's minds um, that are um, regardless of their understanding of connections to things uh, religious, um, deeply um, spiritual. And we know that the two most important needs in, in people's lives are some sense of being loved by others mm -hmm. and some sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that when people's spirits are touched in those two places where they feel loved and valued and where they find meaning and purpose, that... Um, provides spiritual wholeness. And when religion helps people create community where they are loved and welcomed in all their identity and where they are able to organize their thoughts and connect in ways that help them find meaning and purpose, then religion and spirituality and the hungers in people's lives are all, um, I won't say the same, but deeply interconnected. So this is a great topic and thanks for um, thinking of it and inviting us, Tish. I think it was really helpful. Thank you so much. Final thoughts, Rabbi Margaret, Assam? Uh, in this case, I agree with everything Dave just said. Oh, that's a first. No. <laughs> Not really. Uh, we're usually 90% on the same page. Yeah, you usually are. 100% <laughs> wouldn't be good. <laughs> Gotta have something to learn from each other that way. Exactly. Uh <laughs>
No, I agree. I think this is important, and I'm really happy that the library, you know, is hosting these kinds of discussions because I just think that we never get to this level of this discourse because we sort of disagree about whether it should occur or not, or we kind of avoid the topic altogether because we were scared of either of proselytization or whatever, you know. But I just think that it's really important that uh, people uh, discuss whatever the topic is, whether it's economics, the economy, or politics, that they discuss it seriously and take it seriously. Um, and uh, one thing that we didn't even get to is the whole interplay between politics and religion and how that influences, you know, um, how we look at our, our that faith could and be other people. a whole separate program. We tried that I one. I love the Didn't idea. We? Didn't we yeah. try that one last January? I don't think we um, did politics and religion. Not politics directly. Not politics, yeah. Not politics yeah. directly, but some... one of the things that this does, and this is really important, um, we're modeling something that the rest of the country may not be able to do or seems to be enabled to do at the moment. At least large segments of the country would be resistant to it. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, and, and there are even people in our area that would be resistant to this, right? There would be people who might be afraid, I'm sorry to say it this way, that there's a Muslim on the panel in this heightened sense of anti-Semitism, not to link those two together, Azam, really. You know, the, they're all out to get us message is out there. And I know that there's Islamophobia too. We are modeling that kind of civil discourse that's really hard to get to. Yeah. Yeah, our intent well, in designing this series, uh, Sadia Ahmed and I, um, was to build bridges in, in our community. Um, through conversation is how we understand and learn from each other and you know, get to get to appreciate each other's faiths and cultures and viewpoints and and perceptions, and that's really the intent of, of our panel discussions, uh, especially the, the interfaith series. So we will be coming up with uh, more programs along these lines. Uh, we already have some great uh, ideas brewing. And on that note, I wanna thank our audience. Thank you audience for being engaged yourselves uh, in the, the chat box. We will make the recording available uh, sometime next week. Um, feel free to email either me or Sadia asking for the link. Uh, we'll send it out to everybody if we can. Um, so don't despair. We will get that out to you. Um, on that note, uh, thank you again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And we appreciate uh, your attendance this afternoon. Thank you so much.